Hello everyone, I'm Christoph Kusmich and I'll be talking about limit orders and Nightchain uncertainty. This is a joint work with Michael Greinecker, who just recently published the header paper accepted at Econometrica on matching and he's on the job market. He's a great young colleague here. Unfortunately, we don't have a tenure track system. And so if you're interested in hiring a truly excellent uh, economist, uh, economic theorist and a fantastic colleague, please get in touch with him. The structure of this talk will be, I'll give you the paper in a nutshell uh, now, and then I'll give you the main argument in an example so that you can understand it better, and then I'll give you the main model and main result, technically. So not all uncertainty in the world is objective, as is maybe the case in the casino, where you can attach probabilities to certain events, but in, say, soccer game, outcome of that is already somewhat unclear, and uh, things like that can also happen in finance. So one way to deal with such uncertainty is the traditional model of subjective expected utility. But this has become come under some disrepute, empirically speaking, at least since the Asperger experiments that exhibit behavior that cannot be explained by subjective expected utility. And yet many people feel this is reasonable behavior. <clears throat> since then, many alternative models of ambiguity version have since been developed and mostly motivated by these experiments. And finance, I think, so far, clearly the most successful area of application. But what, our model, what we are going to say in this paper, however, is that ambiguity aversion cannot lead to different behavior than subjectively expected utility in finance when people have access to limit orders. Okay, so actually when you have limit orders, access is all that you need. Ambiguity aversion, SEU, is the same. So that means two things. Some of the results under limit orders would not be true. And some of the results that require ambiguity version so far can probably also be done with just subjective expected utility after all. Ambiguity version, what are these things that you can explain uh, with ambiguity version? Let me just go over it quickly. So home bias, investment behavior, equity premium puzzle, excess volatility puzzle, all of these things have been explained fruitfully with ambiguity version. And the driving force behind this is that ambiguity version tends to make investors more cautious, the more conservative positions. But yet again, we are going to say that actually ambiguity version cannot lead to different behavior than subjective expected utility in finance when people have access to limit orders. So all of this would change. So what is the range of what's the, what do we cover in our paper in terms of the result? So this result that ambiguity version is the same as subjective expected utility under limit orders is true for all models of ambiguity version that satisfy two things. One is that they evaluate risk with expected utility, and secondly, they satisfy a sort of monotonicity or dominance axiom. So if there are two choices and one dominates another in every state of the world, then the latter cannot be chosen. This includes most models that have been used in finance and most models that have been developed in, at all, and in particular, the very popular max min expected utility model by Gilbo and Schmeidler and the smooth ambiguity model by Klibanov, Marinacci and Mukherjee. So what's the main argument? It's this. So we go back to an old theorem by uh, Abraham Wald, um, as a sort of it starts us in some sense. Um, so this is called the complete class theorem, and it's popular in game theory as Pierce's lemma in 1984 in the rationalizability paper. My name is there because I retranslated basically um, the original translation from transition theory to game theory back to transition theory. It's not such a big achievement, but uh, anyway, it helped me a lot. But in a, what, what does it say? It says that in a finite decision problem, finite states, finite choices, number of choices, a randomized choice is undominated if and only if it maximizes subjective expected utility with respect to a probabilistic belief over the states of nature. So that, but that, the important thing is that we're in the world of random choices, okay? And if you can choose randomly, in some sense, you will always have to choose, if you want to choose undominatedly, things as if you are Bayesian, as if you are maximizing subjective expected utility. So the key is this randomized choice. And so our view is that ambiguity version basically means that you do not choose randomly or you evaluate random choices strangely or differently. And so then the takeaway is that a, a choice is then consistent with ambiguity version and not at the same time consistent with subjective expected utility only if that choice is strictly dominated by a randomized choice but not strictly dominated by a deterministic choice. Schematically, if that's the set of all choices, you have those that are dominated by a random choice on the left, and these are not possible for a subjective expected utility maximizer. 
But then if you remove those that are dominated by a deterministic choice, then you get those that in the middle here, which gives you basically the range of possible behaviors that can be exhibited by ambiguity verse decision makers and not at the same time as CU decision makers. In our setting, however, that's the punchline, there are no such choices. We just don't have any in if you have limit orders. So saying this differently, maybe more conceptually, limit orders in finance provide a sufficient hedge or man can also call it a commitment device against ambiguity. That's the key takeaway. And now I'm going to explain the argument in a simple example. The example is taken from Dow and the cost of Erlang. The argument is ours. So that's the single asset, let's say, with uncertain future value one or minus one. <coughs> and an investor can buy any amount of the asset in this interval minus one to one. Of course, our, actually our investors will always go extreme, either minus one, one or zero. And a risk-neutral uh, subjective expected utility investor, for instance, in the example, uh, would do what? Well, this person would assign a probability rho to the future value one, or behave as if, and then this person will, well, what will this person do? Well, this person computes the expected value, this rho times one plus one minus rho times minus one, and if that expected value of this asset uh, exceeds the current price, then this person would buy, and if it is below the price, this person would sell. And only if this is exactly equal to this price would this person potentially do nothing or do whatever. So this is schematically what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, you have low prices. That means you're buying, you're positive on this demand. This is your sort of demand function. And then uh, the, the demand jumps down and you're selling suddenly uh, after, a, after the expected value. So this is what a subjective expected utility maximizer would do. But it turns out, and this is what Darwin Verlang point out, that um, for reasons that I don't want to go into at this point, but this uh, an ambiguity verse decision maker could have a different demand function. And let's go back, we're in the same setup, but now we have a risk neutral Gilboa Schmeidler max mean expected utility maximizer, for instance. And this person assigns probabilities in this space, in this set rho L to rho H, okay, so in an interval, so it's a range of priors uh, to the value one. And this person will then do what? Well, they will buy at the price P only if the um, lowest expected value basically exceeds the price and they will sell only if the highest expected value is below the price. That means there is a range of prices in between, as Dao and Tocosta Verdang point out, uh, where this investor would do nothing. So schematically here, this is the demand function as uh, uh, on the axis you have prices. For very low prices on the left, you buy and then it jumps down at this lower expected value and then you do nothing, and then it jumps down and you sell after this last price. And now um, I want to argue that if you introduce limit orders, um, this latter demand function is actually dominated. So now what do we mean by that? So what, how do we, we have to think about what does it mean to have a limit order? What is a limit order? Well, this is how people behave often in stock markets, right? Uh, this is how I can trade. Uh, you go to the stock exchange, you participate somewhere, or you go to a broker and you deliver them your demand function, you know, your limit order. You say, I'm willing to pay up to this price for the asset, or I'm willing to sell above this price for my asset. But if you want to do this, it means that we're executing our limit order, or we are placing our limit order before we know the prices. That means we need to have a model of prices that the decision maker has in mind. And in the general model, this is very flexible. But here in this example, let's assume that prices have in the mind of the decision maker a known distribution with positive density. And you will see then this can, you know, with this we can see the argument very nicely, but we can completely abandon this assumption for the general setup. But importantly, we have to have a view of prices because when we're executing, when we're placing limit orders, of course, we're doing this before we know the current the price that will, will eventually uh, emerge. And of course, way before we know the final value um, of this asset. So what's a limit order then? Or let's say in our paper, a generalized limit order is just a measurable function from prices to purchasing decisions. And now I'm going to argue that the star and the cost of Erlang limit order is strictly dominated. So how do we do this? So this is the down and the cost of Erlang limit, uh, uh, so limit order or down and the cost of Erlang demand function. And now what, what dominates it? Take the point in the middle of this interval. So in the middle, in a sense, probabilistically, take the conditional median of the price given that the price falls into this no trade interval 
and then construct the limit order that buys all the way up to this median and sells below this median. It turns out that this limit order is strictly better than the original limit order regardless of the final value, regardless of the distribution of a final values. So why is that? Well, uh, what, we, what we did with choosing this median, basically it means that conditional on the prices in the interval, this person buys and sells with probability 50%, so equally likely. Okay, so basically it's like flipping a coin and you're buying or selling. If you do this at every price, then it's the same for a risk neutral person as uh, not doing anything. Because you 50% you buy, 50% you sell, so the consequences of this is basically zero. Okay, but you're not doing this quite because what you're doing here is you buy when prices are low, because you're only doing it on the left, and you sell when prices are high. And that, one can show, generates really an additional expected profit. This is why uh, the original Dow and the cost of Erlang demand function or limit order is strictly dominated by another uh, demand, uh, another limit order, a deterministic limit order. And so um, this was the example and this will lead us to the following theorem eventually that you cannot completely yet understand because I haven't given you all the ingredients, but I will repeat it at the end. So any optimal limit order of an investor with monotone preferences that is compatible with the given Bernoulli utility function maximizes subjective expected utility with respect to some probabilistic belief. It covers ambiguity versus decision makers as long as they have these two criteria, they have monotone preferences um, and they have um, preferences that are compatible with a given utility function, general utility function. So they evaluate risk with expected utility. So now, in order to give you this uh, theorem clearly, let me tell you what the model is, the full model looks like. Um, so instead of having just two final values, now we have multiple sort of models that the decision maker may have in, the, in, in, in mind. So we have a family, V of Y. So Y is basically an index and it indices, so it's, for every Y you have a different model of the world and you don't know what the true Y is. So a V of Y is then a probability distribution on price cross final value. Okay, so it's a joint distribution of our current prices or immediate prices and eventual final values representing the potential joint distribution of price and final values of the asset. And you have a Bernoulli utility function with which you evaluate money. And you have an interval that is, um, has a lower and upper bound. The lower bound is usually considered negative and the upper bound positive, representing the amount the decision maker is allowed to buy of the asset. I'm going to have to make a few assumptions. Okay. So first of all, the Bernoulli utility function is continuous and increasing. For the main result, we don't even need it to be concave. <clears throat> and this space of models is a compact metric space. And there is a measurable function h, which is basically the density. So what does it depend? <clears throat> it's a density of pairs, prices, and final values. <clears throat> and it's indexed by the models. Okay, so each different y gives you different density. And so that's what we have. This is our state, uh, our state space. This is what the decision maker has in mind. The decision maker does not know what is the true model, but this is the range of possible true models. And this is a very technical assumption. Let me just say briefly that it means that uh, we can even allow fairly fat tails, but the tails are not allowed to be super duper fat. Okay. But uh, one could probably even dispense with this a little bit. This is adapted from uh, Balder 1988. Then we have limit orders as just measurable functions from prices to um, purchasing quantities. And we have a space of limit orders uh, L and a set of mixed limit orders, the distributions over limit orders. And then we can define the payoff function from a mixed limit order mu in every state y. So this is a mixed limit order mu and a, a state y and it follows this formula. It's um, very um, you will understand it if you read the paper. And I will just say that we can attach to every single mixed limit order and in every single state we can attach a utility level. <clears throat> and then we will say that a mixed limit order dominates another mixed limit order if it basically generates a higher expected value in that state 
compared to the other limit order and that in every state. And we will say that a mixed limit order that is not dominated by any mixed limit order is undominated. And we will say a mixed limit order that is not dominated by any deterministic limit order is deterministically undominated. So now we have uh, two steps we need. First is we need this valid complete class theorem here again. We need a version of Pierce's lemma again, which basically we get, which is that a mixed limit order lambda is undominated if and only if there exists a probability distribution beta over the space of all models that we have uh, states such that lambda maximizes subjective expected utility. And that can be shown again in our setup as well. Um, <clears throat> we do this by basically representing mixed limit orders by the compact convex set of joint distributions of prices and trades induced by the wald wolfowitz theorem. And then we use the generalization of Pierce's theorem by Batigali, Cerea, Violio, Macaroni, and Marinacci in 2016. But that's just establishing that it's also true in our case that we have this Pierce lemma, basically. But then the key result is this, that a mixed limit order is undominated in our setting if and only if it is deterministically undominated, which then means that there is no scope for ambiguity version to explain anything else than subjective expected utility already does. The proof idea is this. Suppose you have a limit order that is dominated by a mixed limit order. One can approximate the dominating mixed limit order by a deterministic limit order that still dominates the original mixed limit order. So conceptually, suppose you have these two limit orders here and you're randomizing with the coin flip between the two. So then what you can basically do is you can sort of represent it by a highly oscillating limit order that is however deterministic. So if you go from low prices to high prices, you frequently switch between buying and selling. And that would essentially give you the same payoff and that can be shown using the approximation theorems of Vaga or Milgram and Weber. And then we get indeed this theorem again that any optimal limit order of an investor with monotone, not necessarily even complete or transitive preferences, that is compatible with the given Bernoulli utility function, maximizes subjective expected utility with respect to some probabilistic belief. So that means, again, this is our way of saying, uh, if you have limit orders, if you have access to limit orders, at least in our setting, which is fairly general, but not dynamic. Um, in our setting, you get that uh, an ambiguity versus decision maker, as long as this person has monotone preferences and uh, uh, evaluates risk with expected utility, will behave as if this person was a subjective expected utility maximizer. So these are the takeaways. Ambiguity version cannot really lead to different behavior than subjective expected utility in finance when people have access to limit orders because limit orders in finance provide a sufficient hedge and commitment against ambiguity. And that's true for all preference models that evaluate objective risk with expected utility and that satisfy a monotonicity axiom. And I'm happy to discuss the consequences of this in what follows. Thank you very much.